Great. So, are there any quantum physicists among us? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm happy about that. Um, I have rather provocatively titled my talk, How to Design an Eternal Universe. And I think um, it's probably one of the foremost questions in all our minds, what is the next world going to be like? How similar to our own world will it be? Will it be something completely different? Is it going to be thrown away like some metaphors in the Bible suggest? Or is it just going to be built on the foundations of this world? Perhaps like Jesus' resurrection visits tend to indicate where he freely walked amongst his disciples and seemed to eat and drink and do all those sort of things with them. I'm not pretending that I'm going to give you a definitive answer tonight, but I think that quantum theory uh, takes us a, a big stride forward into believing that this, the way God designed this universe uh, is not one, it's not a universe that's going to be discarded. I think if we have a very simplified view that s science today wants us to have, um, simple models, simple biological models, simple mental, uh, simple models of the mind, of matter, uh, you sort of think, well, surely there's got to be something better than this one. Um, something's got to be redesigned radically. But I'm hoping that by the end of it, you will think we've got a pretty good starting point with the universe we've already got. Um, and of course, there's been some pretty big claims made about um, this universe already. Uh, Psalm 19, of course, is a perfect example. David, ma David makes some wild claims about this universe. Uh, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth their words to the ends of the world. And then, of course, he goes on to describe more esoteric things. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the law are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. Uh, seems um, pretty hard to argue that that's not a fairly high view of the current universe. And of course, um, on slide three, I've just given a little collage some of the things that God has managed to put together for us in this current age, whether it be beautiful mountains, amazing galaxies, lovely vistas of ponds and plant life, societies, great intellects, families, poor old Notre Dame that burnt to the ground and all that human ingenuity that that produced and uh, all the arts, Picasso, music, whatever you like to think of. It's a fairly amazing thing that's already here. And of course it raises the question, has God peaked already? <laughs> you know, He's resting now on the seventh day, so the next one's going to be an anticlimax. I think we all have that kind of worry that um, it's going to be boring. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of action happening in this universe, let's face it. Lots, lots going on uh, from uh, unlimited... Um, physical, mental, emotional, political experiences that we all share every day. That is boring, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so 
So this, this model that seems to be um, much maligned by non-Christian circles of floating around <coughs> on clouds, it's not one that really rings true with how the next life is going to be. And of course, um, so you would think there's going to be more content in the next iteration, not less. It's going to be more sophisticated. You know, if, if there's politics, they're going to be more, more interesting. If there's philosophy, it's going to be more philosophical. If there's relationships, they're going to be more vibrant. Um, and I've just picked out a couple of verses which hint, I think, at that. I've just used Hebrews 2 on slide 4. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking, so, first and foremost, we're going to have to run this place by the sound of it. Whatever it is that's coming next, we are going to be in charge. We're going to have to run it. And I assume we're going to have to run it pretty well because it's going to be pretty, pretty sophisticated. But there is a place where someone has testified, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, a son of man that you care for him? You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet which we are very familiar with that passage, of course. But and w the high view of humanity that that espouses, the incredibly high view, crowned with glory and honor, and everything put under our feet, means that we are going to be spectacular creatures, presumably. Um, and I alluded to that somewhat in my last talk. Uh, and what I want to go on to argue is that unless you understand quantum th a bit about quantum theory, at least that it has restored mystery to the universe, you're stuck in very old ways of thinking if you're a, a, if you're a follower of someone like Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens who seem to have a very boring, mechanical, low view of what it is to be a human. They'll claim not. They'll claim, oh, no, it's a wonderful thing that somehow atoms came together by chance and made these sophisticated machines. But really, I don't think it's um, getting, to, well, it's not getting to the heart of what our day-to-day -day experiences is of being a human being. Um, and of course, the famous passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. So that doesn't, I think, do justice to any of those passages we've just read. Um, and especially when you put it in the context of 1 Corinthians 15, which I also went through last, last time, but I think it's worth <coughs> repeating some of it. Because it is, a, I think it's a key question, isn't it, in our minds. We, we, we put it to the back and we think, oh, we just have to trust that it's going to be pretty good. But you can't help speculating. What's it really going to be like? And so someone will ask, how are the dead raised and what kind of body will they come? How foolish what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. So we have already... I think that implies that the seed of what is coming, the DNA, is already here. We can take some understanding of the, the next life from what we're experiencing in this life. What that is, is of course still very mysterious, but it has to be something around what it is to be human in this life. And then he goes through a long passage about saying how there are different kinds of bodies, and just down in 50, or actually, 
Well, I'll go to 46. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that, all f that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet... For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. What is the nature of that change? I don't know. <laughs> but by the end of tonight, I hope, or within the next hour, I hope that um, we've got some hints, perhaps. What I'm proposing is that what's happening here on earth is the seed. And it's not going to be thrown away. God said that was very good. It was very, very good. And it will remain, but it will be changed. It will be transformed. Now, I think it's fair to say that we're both going to have a tough time from this point on. Because for a start, it's going to be hard for me to give you a good overview of quantum mechanics in one hour, and it's going to be just as hard for you to grasp quantum mechanics in one hour if you're not familiar with it. But I'll do my very best, and we'll see how we go. This is just as boring. The current general view of what the world is made of. If you look at the bottom right hand corner of slide 8, a typical quote from Richard Dawking, Dawkins, we are survival machines, robot vehicles blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes. Uh, well that, that's from his book The Selfish Gene. 2500 years ago Democritus said something similar, and I had this slide up during my last talk. By convention, sweet is sweet. This is Democritus in 460 BC. By convention, sweet is sweet. By convention, bitter is bitter. By convention, hot is hot. By convention, cold is cold. By convention, color is color. But in the reality, there are atoms and the void. That is, the objects of sense are supposed to be real and it is customary to regard them as such, but in truth, they are not. Only the atoms and the void are real. I really can't see any difference between what Democritus said two and a half thousand years ago and what Christopher Dawkins said a couple of years ago. No progress in two and a half thousand years, philosophically. Um, however, Science hasn't been standing still. And I, I have to say that Richard Dawkins is a biologist who doesn't really grapple with any of the new physics on which his whole worldview is based. His, his worldview is based on an atomistic, materialistic view of life, of humanity, whereas that debate has moved vastly in the last 100 years, starting in 1905, when Einstein announced his theory of relativity. And we did all this last week. I'm not going to rehash it, but I would just say, again, 2,000 odd years ago, in your bottom left-hand corner of slide nine, Euclid came up with geometry. And it, that was conceived, that was a mental model of what space was like. That was a mental model of space. It allowed us to manipulate space, it allowed us to construct buildings for 2,000 years, it allowed us to uh, estimate distances. It was a mental model, a tool that, that was trying to describe the physical reality that was space. Well, since relativity, of course, we've learned that time and space are all relative, that space is curved, 
um, that 180 degree triangles don't actually add, add up to 180 degrees in curved space and that light is the ultimate constant of the universe not space and time science went on and progressed through Newton to build more sophisticated models of what we thought was space and time mathematics was developed uh, calculus Newton developed Newton and Leibniz developed calculus 400 odd years ago and that was a mental model also it was a tool that was able to allow us to predict and create and design more sophisticated um, mechanisms, cannons. Projectile motion is a, is a good example, I think, of a mental model that describes a reality. It's not the reality, it's just a convenient tool for helping us predict what reality is. Of course, since Einstein, we've had to modify Newton, again, to take into account the fact that time dilates, length, contra length contracts, and relativistic mass changes. So Erwin Schrödinger, the develop one of the key developers of quantum theory, I think makes this point very well in a book he wrote in 1954 called Sh Nature and the Greeks, in which he goes back to Greek thought and basically says pretty much they thought of everything two and a half thousand years ago. There hasn't been a lot new said, except perhaps once relativity and quantum theory came along. Until not very long ago, scientists used to be content with the primary qualities such as extension, motion, matter. These primary qualities were thought to be the extract, the true and unshakable, distilled by reason from the direct yield of our own sense data. This view is, of course, no longer acceptable since we have learnt from the theory of relativity, if we did not know it before, that space and time and the shape and motion of matter in space and time are, are, are an elaborate and hypothetical construct of the mind, not at all unshakable. So is that. I'm on slide 12 for the, those listening the recording and it shows a, a mental picture that most of us would have in our mind of an atom some little nucleus with an electron swirling around mostly con composed of empty space that is nothing more than Euclidean geometry Newtonian calculus um, or any other mental construct we have that allows us to deal with and manipulate our experiences. It doesn't in any way have any contact with what reality is. And we get hints of that because when, you, when we invented the atomic bomb, suddenly matter took on a totally different potentiality in our minds. We didn't realize there was all that power and energy lying latent in a ball of uranium, 10 kilogram ball of uranium, suddenly unleashed almost unlimited power and energy. Where did that come from? And of course, Einstein's famous equation equals mc squared, related mass and energy and the speed of light all in one very elegant equation, one elegant mysterious equation. All it did was make energy and mass more mysterious, not less mysterious, but uh, and of course in the sun we've got nuclear fusion going on unimaginable uh, qualities of matter that we can't comprehend so mental models are very useful we need technological progress occurs because we learn to simplify our understanding simplify, categorize our understanding of the physical world and thereby manipulate it to our own advantage. And this is the same process that happened in chemistry. Chemistry, there's a mental, the, the, me, the mental model of the atom is a useful tool because it allows us to classify 
things that we encounter in the world and then start to manipulate them by heating them, combining them, dissolving them. But it's not really telling us anything fundamental about what's there. But we are, of course, as a human race, endlessly inquisitive and want to know absolutely what is there. And, if, and in modern philo philosophy, if you do study philosophy in a modern university, you don't get very far without somebody telling you you really need to study philosophy of science. Because as science has progressed, philosophy has been relegated into one little corner of science. It's become a, uh, an adjunct to the real philosophy, which these days, as Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins would have us believe, science has become the ultimate philosophy because it is the true description of reality. So we've gone down this path to try and tunnel in, burrow down and discover what's, what reality is all about. And we've gone down through the, the atoms. We've broken up the atom into the nucleus and the proton and the neutron. And when that wasn't, and then we built big machines like the Large Hadron Collider to smash these particles together in very energetic explosions. And somehow out of that came things like um, hadrons and mu mesons and baryons so that the family of elementary particles, rather than simplifying our understanding, has become more and more complicated again. There are almost as many elementary particles now as there is p chemical uh, elements in the periodic table. So nature doesn't seem to be revealing its secrets very much to us. And of course, this comes from a general philosophical belief in a discipline called Muriology. And myriology is nothing but the abstract study of the relations between parts and wholes. The whole is just the sum of its parts. That's at the foundation of our modern worldview, our modern scientific worldview. Um, so, sorry, that's a bit of a fuzzy slide on 15, but you know, if you imagine A, B, C, D are the atoms down the bottom, they start to combine into more complicated atoms where there's just two of them, then three of them, and all the way up until you get to a human being. And then on slide 16, this is what uh, psychologists call the myriological fallacy, that basically that loop is valid. Namely, you start at an atom, you build up the elements, which it forms molecules, you progress to DNA and life, gets more and more complicated, which uh, s forms neurons, and neurons give you N Nelson Mandela, apparently. And then, then you have societies, you have politics, you have law, you have families, you have everything that comes just from that little atom on the left. That's the myriological fallacy. The sum is just, the whole is just the sum of the parts. And I like to think that that's our world view, the current scientific world view on slide 17. We're nothing but a Lego set, God's Lego set, put together um, by assembling atoms. How does everyone, does everyone sort of agree that that's the underlying narrative? It is boring and it's very fatalistic. In 1905, Einstein released his paper on relativity. By 1915, he d developed that into general re relativity. But the biggest and most amazing shift in um, 
our understanding of the world came with quantum theory. So I'm now going to try and whiz through quantum theory for you and hopefully it's understandable. If not, I don't know, I've given it my best shot in the time available. So let's, I've used this, I think, I've used this image on the left before in a talk I gave, a very short talk I gave on quantum theory. And this is a good place to start, the coin toss. We tend to think that the coin toss is a random event. People gamble on it because it's supposed to be ramble, random. But it's not really random. As I've shown in that diagram, from the moment that coin leaves the finger, it's just that the, the physics is very complicated. Trying to predict the spin, the energy imparted to the coin when you flick it up, it becomes a very difficult process. But it's not impossible to model that process because the coin doesn't flicker in and out of existence. The coin doesn't uh, disappear into some unknown universe. It's we believe that it's actually there. It's a solid object spinning according to the laws of physics. Another way of looking at it is the photo on the right, which is a, an aeroplane propeller. While it's spinning very fast, we are, we are, and we can look, see through it, we assume it's actually there. There is some that the, the blades of the propeller are actually visible and it's accessible to us. And then if we put something in, we would, we would actually stop the blades spinning and they would be um, propeller blades to look at. So a philosophical way to describe this is that it's an, our knowledge of the coin and our knowledge of the propeller is an epistemological problem. It's a, no, it's a problem about how we gain knowledge. It's not an ontological problem. It's not a problem of the, what actually is there the being, the essence of the coin and the propeller. And that if we can just increase our knowledge, improve our measuring instruments, uh, we could maybe set up radar to track the coin toss. We might be able to use microwaves to, to track it and a very sophisticated computer to, to um, do things that our, the human eye can't do anymore, then we will at some point have a sophisticated enough measuring device so that we can understand fully and predict the outcome of, of coin toss. Does everyone sort of follow that? Um, so that's the sort of world view that an atomistic view delivers to us. Ultimately, whether it's a coin toss, a propeller, or a human being, they're just epistemological problems to, s to work out. How do we just improve our measuring instruments, our ability to study them, so that we can dissect them enough to arrive at a true understanding of how they work? Well, that's a fairly, um, that's a view which has a lot of hubris to it, I would say. I would, I would posit that um, as human beings, we kind of think we're going to nail that one at some point. We've got the tools um, and our intellect will eventually lead to an epistemological solution to everything that we can find. What I like, what quantum theory is sh showing us is that is entirely broken, that system. It is not even there. It's not what reality is. Quantum theory is an ontological problem with a seemingly unbridgeable gap between us and reality. And if I was going to, if I was God and I was going to design a universe, I would certainly want to make it 
so mysterious that it was at least going to be interesting to us, not something that we just thought, yeah, we'll, we'll nail that one in a few years. So let's talk about quantum theory. This, I would argue, is a traditional view If we take, let me say it this way, let's say we take a myriological view of reality that we just have to break it down smaller and smaller and let's take the standard model that we all have in our minds that we're actually all atoms and that we are, that those atoms are composed of protons, neutrons and electrons. So if we're using a myriological system our epistemol where we should be focusing our epistemological energies is on figuring out what a proton, neutron and an electron is. Because once we've got that nailed, we can start to build back up again and explain everything there is to explain. The problem was, well, our instruments started to get epistemologically able to look at protons, neutrons and electrons around the turn of the around 1920s and we started to find very strange things about them. They didn't behave like real objects, like solid objects, like to coins or like aeroplane propellers. We found that they were very crazy things and I want to show you, I want to try and show you how crazy they are and how mysterious they are. So, imagine you're a golfer, which this slide 20 shows a golfer hitting golf balls against a barrier with two slits in the barrier. <coughs> Let's say he fires a thousand golf balls. Behind the first barrier is a second barrier with a screen. It's, it's a screen. And the golf balls all have paint on them. So every time a golf ball passes through, most of the golf balls will drop in front of the first screen because nobody's good enough to hit a golf ball through those two slots every time. But some will pass through those slots if you hit enough golf balls and they'll pass through to the screen at the back and will make a little blue dot before dropping down to the base. Everybody following that so far? But of course, real objects in the world can only travel in straight lines. You've never seen a golf ball do a loop the loop, figure eight, and then uh, come back 100 metres and then forward another 150 metres and drop in the hole. Usually when you hit a golf ball, it, it obeys the laws of physics, follows the the parabola, follow, it goes in a straight line. So when we're talking about golf balls, we're dealing with what we would call real objects. Let's do the same thing with water. Let's imagine there's two slits I in a barrier and we're sending a water wave towards that barrier. This is on slide 21. As the water wave hits the barrier with two slits, it diffracts and those waves start to interfere with each other. This is all high school physics. Of course, if you just have little individual water drops, they're not going to interfere with each other if you pass them two through slits. But if you have a whole interconnected mass of water in a wave, it will start to diffract. And at the bottom of the screen, it shows two possible interference effects. One is a constructive interference, and that is where the wave peaks coincide with each other from the two slots. And there you'll get a, an increased, even higher wave. Or in the, where the troughs coincide, you'll get sorry, where, where a peak and a trough coincides, you'll get nothing. 
and then everything in between depending on how the waves line up. If you throw two, if you throw two pebbles in a pond, you'll get the same effect. That's a typical wave effect. Now let's do the same thing with light. You can pass light through a, a barrier with two slits in it and it will show the interference effect that a wa water wave will. And on the right hand side of slide 22 you see a typical interference pattern. If you set up a light source with a barrier and two slits and a screen behind it. Now let's try electrons. This is where it gets very strange and if you understand this slide you will understand quantum theory. Let's start, let's say you can make an electron gun which we can, we can make an electron gun. I personally can't make an electron gun but I'm reliably informed that <laughs> humanity is quite capable of making an electron gun. In fact a television, an old television was an electron gun. Let's fire electrons at a two slit barrier just like we did with golf balls, waves and light. What we find is if we put a screen behind you get an interference pattern which means we're firing a solid seemingly particle because an electron is a, is a piece of matter. But on the screen behind we see a wave characteristic. So that electron is not moving like a golf ball in a straight line from its source to the screen. It's taking an unknown route. It's taking a route which cause an interference pattern. It's behaving like a wave. It starts as a particle, behaves like a wave and then when it hits the screen it turns back into a particle again. Let me explain that. Let's do something very sneaky and try and outsmart the electron because let's say we fire a whole heap of electrons we can argue well that's just a physical phenomenon, a wave phenomenon just like a water wave. There's just a whole mass of electrons somehow diffracting physically through the, the slits. Let's try and outsmart the electron now and just fire one at a time. So we just go fire one electron. You'd think it can't, it can't interact with any other particles. So now it's really got to behave like a golf ball. It's either got to go through one slit or the other. But no, an electron still takes up its position on the diffraction pat, the interference pattern on the far screen. So what that means is, well, we don't know what it means. But w what it hits at is that once the electron leaves the electron gun, it becomes this extended entity behaving nothing at all like particle, nothing at all like a piece of matter, but something that is an has an extended wave-like ontology that can pass through two slits at the same time so that it can interfere with itself and then take up a position as if it had been in a wave on the uh, back screen. Have I lost you? Still okay? That's what it looks like. And this is a very interesting slide also because when it's... Um, imagine again we're just sending one electron at a time through. The first electron... The first few... This is slide 24. The first few electrons you'll see seem to be random but they won't be golf ball like. They haven't just gone straight through and impacted the screen where you would expect a golf ball to impact. But you still, s what they've done is they've collapsed back out of their wave like characteristic 
and appeared as a dot again. So when you measure them, they appear like golf balls, but in between, they behave like waves. And as you keep firing single electrons, eventually they will take their place on the interference pattern, as you can see in slide E down the bottom. Now, would you, there's only a few more slides of the heavy stuff, then we'll get onto the interesting stuff. But if you can just hang in there for a little while longer, we'll start to look at the ramifications of this strange reality that we're talking about. And if, if you uh, are familiar with any conversations about quantum theory, you'll, you may have heard, well, is, is matter a wave or particle? Matter, wave, particle, duality. Well, the, the, sh the answer is, it looks like matter at its most fundamental level behaves like both. When, it's cre when we create it at the electron gun, it's a particle, then it diffuses into some unknown substance that behaves like a wave, and then when we measure it again on our screen, it's again a particle. So that's just on slide 24, you can see the first diagram on the left shows a pure wave, like light, although light is not a pure wave, but we'll say, say it is for the time being. In the middle, it's golf balls. To the right is electrons, which combines the characteristics of the first and the second. Types of stuff, whatever they might be. Let's see if we can keep outsmarting the electron. This is what physicists do. You know, they, they, they try and run it every way they possibly can to see if they can get right to the bottom of what these things are. I mean, I say electron, but you know, you can do it with protons, neutrons, you can do it with small, you can do it with atoms, molecules. They all behave in the same way. Let's set up a measuring device. Instead of a, a screen like we have down the bottom of slide 26, let's set up just two particle detectors only, like Geiger counters for example, that are perfectly aligned with the direction a particle would need to take if it was emitted like a golf ball. Well, the electron can detect whether we've got a screen or a Geiger counter there. It knows whether to behave like a golf ball at, under that experimental condition or whether to behave like a, a wave if we've set it up, if we've set the experiment up in the other way. It's getting weirder now. It's getting very weird. Let's do now. We that's let's do a delayed choice double slit experiment. Why not? Because we're really trying to figure out what's down there. You can see on slide twenty seven. Same setup, you've got a, well, it's this diagram says a photon source, but a photon, electron, proton, neutron, whatever it is. You send it through the two slits. After it's passed through the two slits and presumably interfered with itself and should be taking up an interference pattern on your screen, you very sneakily shut the double slit, shut one of the two slits before it hits the screen so that it's got no way of interfering like a wave. Well, there's not no way. So that after it's been past the interference point in the experiment, we've tricked it and said, we're shutting one of the gates, we've tricked you. No, the electron will actually detect after it's passed through that, the two slits, that you have now shut this one of the slits on it, it, will s it, the interference pattern will drop off and you'll get a golf ball pattern appearing. What is this implying? 
Well, we don't know. But one thing it implies is the electron is capable of backwards causation or it's capable of detecting what the, what the measurement device is doing constantly while in real time while it's happening. So it seems to have instantaneous communication with all its environment round about it and can modify its own ontological status depending on what's what's going on around it and particularly how we've decided to measure it. If we want to measure it as a wave, it'll behave like a wave for us. If we want to measure it as a particle, it's quite happy to oblige and behave like a particle. If we want to try and trick it halfway through, it'll transition from a wave to a particle to match our measuring instruments. So electron is a very, very strange thing, as is a proton and neutron. It's nothing like it's it's actually nothing like we understand matter to be. Can I just replay that because this is like uh, we're creating nature and nature's creating us sort of thing. Because um, obviously if there's a single slit and you shot through a single slit, you'll get a single slit pattern. When you put the double slits up, you get the wave pattern at the back. So what you do is I'll shoot them through the double slit and before it reaches the back wall, I'll close one of the slits. Yeah. Uh, but in, in, if any logic applied, well, you know, that, that's already gone, that particle. It should create a wave pattern. Yeah. It's already passed through the slits, right. right? But it doesn't. Then it sort of knows I've shut one of the slits so it reverts. Yes, before I've measured it. Just before I've measured it. Yeah. yeah. That sounds very strange, doesn't it? So. If you're trying to build a mechanical worldview out of that, you've got real problems. It kind of makes nature living. It does, yes, and interactive. Very living, interactive, interconnected. It's called, well, it's called quantum entanglement. Every particle in the universe is entangled with every other particle in the universe. And there's no theoretical reason why uh, electrons in the Andromeda galaxy are not instantaneously connected to us according by quantum entanglement. Just be, are you going to explain where the word quantum came from later on? Or? Not really. It just means it's it's a very simple term meaning packet or yeah packet. Mm. I mean, there's lots of other there's lots of things about quantum theory that I'm not going to go into tonight because I'm just trying to distill out the most relevant part of it for a, that might have some interest, I hope, from a theory, theological point of view. So basically, on slide, slide 28, quantum theory demonstrates that the foundational elements of matter are totally mysterious between measurements and only enter space and time once me, we measure or collapse them. It's almost implying unless we're looking at them, they're not there in any real sense that we understand. Now, of course, this is a hot debate still, very hot debate in modern physics. And it's a problem that has not been solved in nearly 100 years. And there's no progress being made on this problem in 100 years. Um, and then what you get is interpretations of the data from the most famous, which is the Copenhagen interpretation, which was developed by whatever, who everyone calls the father of quantum theory, which is Niels Bohr. He created, he, he was the one who really uh, nailed down the current quantum theory. He had some very gifted students who he mentored through it, particularly Heisenberg and Schrodinger. And together, they, they developed the quantum theory over a number of years. Um, then you've got to, uh, to, I'll just keep going a little while longer and then I'll speak a bit more about interpretations. So 
I'm hoping you can see the difference between an epistemological problem now and an ontological problem, which is called the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. When we measure things, strange ontological things happen in quantum theory. We're used to measuring things without any repercussions. We, 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 we regard ourselves as unattached, um, uninteractive bystanders observing the world go by. But in quantum theory, when you're doing your experiments, you're part of the whole measurement system. That kills objectivity. The measurement problem kills objectivity. Yes, it, it, it kills externality. You know. Yeah. Object you can't objectify anything anymore. You're part of the system. You're part of the whole interconnected, entangled quantum system. Um, and on slide 30, a whole new branch of mathematics had to be developed to account for quantum theory because quantum theory is not a theory about ontology. It's a theory about measurement because we don't know what the ontology is of the world around us. We don't know what being is. We don't know what, what we're made of. We don't know how to describe what the world is made up of. All we can do is describe the measurements we make of it. Now, you, you and I are making measurements all the time. We've got lots of measuring apparatuses, our eyes, our ears, touch, all sorts of things things but um, and we can augment all those senses of course with measuring instruments which we we do with atomic physics uh, atomic experiments but basically the mathematics of quantum theory is you're just dealing in probabilities you're making all you're doing is making predictions about the probability of being able to measure something in a particular sh place with or a particular energy level or with a particular mass or even more weird and wonderful things like spin, angular momentum uh, and if you're getting into quarks you're measuring, they don't even know what physical characteristics they have so they, they call quarks up, down, strange, colour, charm you know, they just make up terms to describe these unknowable physical characteristics. But the bo box in the bottom right-hand corner, what's happening between our measurements, we don't know. It could be going in and out of all the, the, the slits. It could be doubling back on itself. It could be spread out. There is no... There is no um, understanding or explanation of what goes on between a measurement event. In other words, between s until it interacts with us. Because when we send it, when we create an electron gun, we're int we're making a measurement. Actually, we're designing an instrument. We're fashioning the world into a particular way. So we're we're measuring the world. We think we don't think of it in that way, but from point of quantum theory we are we're making a measurement every time we design something we're making a measurement onto the world as soon as though as soon as we've released it out of the gun it's gone we don't know what's happening to it until we decide to make another measurement at the other end this be, this creates a big problem of course in measurement when do matter waves become particles? Well, when you measure them. But what constitutes a measurement? That's the big question. What constitutes a measurement in quantum mechanics? And this is where interpretations come in. There's, there's as many quantum physicists as exist, there are interpretations of the measurement problem. And you'll find physicists existing on a, a, a grand range of spectrums. Yes, yeah, so it's a bit like theology, you know. You go all the way from universalism to uh, eternal, constant, conscious torment. 
same spectrum. Um, there's just as broad a spectrum on quantum physics interpretation of what reality is all about. On the one hand, you have the realists who say, well, they, they believe that it's still an epistemological problem, basically. And that we just have to look a bit deeper, look a bit harder, and we'll somehow we'll find what they call hidden variables. There are variables which we haven't discovered yet, but we will one day when our instruments get sophisticated enough. Um, then you've got interpretation. Some of you may have heard of the many worlds interpretation of quantum theory, where, which is a totally loopy one in my view, but uh, a guy called Everett got a PhD for this one. Uh, he said every time you make a measurement, no, sorry, every time you, uh, every time an electron uh, entangles with another electron, the universe, the whole universe splits. So there's actually unlimited numbers of universes unfolding as the, the whole electron dilemma unfolds. Anyway, the most common and I would say the most interesting philosophically is called Copenhagen interpretation, which is the one that Niels Bohr, Schrodinger and Heisenberg came up with. And I think it's the one that gives the, the most intriguing view of quantum theory. In the bottom right-hand corner, two quotes from Bohr. Everything we call real is made of things that cannot be regarded as real. And it, another phrase here, if quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. <laughs> And um, the big problem is, so when does, a me when does a measurement occur? When do these waves turn back into particles? If, if we fire off an electron and let it go without putting any screen in front of it, well, it's off into the quantum universe. There's no screen there to collapse it. There's no measurement event to turn it back into a particle. But it's interacting with other electrons, presumably, which are these other wavy objects, and there, but there's still nobody to interact with it except other electrons. Surely one electron can't measure another electron, although that's one interpretation that if you get enough electrons into a group, that's called the decoherence, that once a, a system becomes complicated enough, it will collapse itself. Um, but there's nothing in the actual mathematics or theory which will allow that process to occur. You just say, bang, it happens. It, that's an external assumption to the theory. And the Copenhagen interpretation basically says, we don't know where that process happens. There is no way of knowing where a measurement takes place. We see collapsed. Everywhere is collapsed. You and I have collapsed. We are. We have collapsed out of that quantum soup into real things. What would we call real things? On the slide it says dogs, cats, physicists and snakes. That's, what, that's the world we experience. We don't experience quantum waves. Um, but Copenhagen interpretation leads us in a very interesting direction that, to where human consciousness starts to become a very interesting player in all this. But the Copenhagen interpretation stops short of saying that it's actually the human mind. It's the great collapser of the universe. But in fact, that's a very serious and well-accepted interpretation of quantum mechanics. Now I'd like to go on to a few quotes by physicists that I think bring out the essence of the mystery of quantum theory and the problems that it's caused for our worldview. Then came quantum theory which totally transformed our image of matter. 
The old assumption that the microscopic world of atoms was simply a scaled down version, the myriology, of the everyday world had to be abandoned. Newton's deterministic machine was replaced by a shadowy and paradoxical conjunction of waves and particles, governed by the laws of chance rather than the rigid rules of causality. And I haven't got into Heisenberg's uncertainty principle because I didn't think it was necessary to, to give you the essence of what quantum theory is all about. An extension of the quantum theory goes beyond even this. It paints a picture in which solid matter dissolves away to be replaced by weird excitations and vibrations of invisible field energy. Quantum physics undermines materialism because it reveals that matter has far less substance than we might believe. Um, in the world of the very small, where particles and wave aspects of reality are equally significant, things do not behave in any way that, can be a, that we can understand from our experience in the everyday world. It isn't just that Bohr's atom, Bohr's atom was a very, that very simplistic view, model of what an atom is. It isn't just that Bohr's atom with its electron orbits is a false picture. All pictures are false and there is no physical analogy we can make to understand what goes on inside atoms. Atoms behave like atoms, nothing else. Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington, one of the towering physicists and summed up the situation brilliantly in his book, The Nature of the Physical World, published in 1929. No familiar concepts can be woven around the electron, he said, and our best description of the atom boils down to something, to something unknown is doing we don't know what. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is probably the, the premise of <coughs> physicist at his time. <laughs> Einstein, he, he was a contemporary of Einstein, and he was the one who actually did the experimental There are only two people in the world who understand general relativity. And one of them is Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington. Implied, of course, he was this one. So this is his description of the physical world. Uh, he notes that this does not sound a particularly illuminating theory. I have read something like it elsewhere. And then he quotes, then he quotes Jabberwocky. As Ed Eddington pointed out more than 50 years ago, all the fundamentals of physics can be translated into Jabberwocky. There would be no loss of meaning and conceivably a great benefit if we broke the instinctive associ association in our minds of atoms with hard spheres and electrons with tiny particles. I think it's worth reading these because they express the measurement problem very well. Descartes founded the image of the human mind as a sort of nebulous substance that exists independently of the body. Much later, in the 1930s, Gilbert Ryle derided this dualism in a pithy reference to the mind part as the ghost of the machine, which Tony alluded to at the start. Ryle articulated his criticism during the triumphal phase of materialism and mechanism. The machine he referred to as the human body and the human brain themselves just part of the large cosmic machine, the myriological interpretation, obviously. But already when he coined that pithy expression, the new physics was at work, undermining the worldview on which Ryle's philosophy was based. Today, on the brink of the 21st century, we can see Ryle was right to dismiss the notion of ghost of the machine. Not because there is no ghost, but because there is no machine. This time quote. We're getting close to the end now. Quantum mechanics considers both the atom and the measuring device to be incomprehensible. We cannot understand the quantum world because its nature is utterly alien to human thought. Quantum theory predicts how a classical measuring instrument will respond to a quantum system, but the theory itself does not contain such measuring devices. Nothing in there but proxy waves or quantum waves. Fortunately for the practice of physics, each of us is born into a world already inhabited by these inexplicable measuring devices. Your eye right is one example. In other words, the old physics attempted to explain macroscopic objects in terms of the atoms which make them up. The new physics explains atoms in terms of macroscopic objects. In this inverted Copenhagen scheme, there is a sense in which this firework is going, <laughs> there is a sense 
sense in which atoms are made of measuring instruments and not the other way around. One of the main facts of life is that we radically change whatever we observe. Legendary King Midas never knew the feel of silk or a human hand after everything he touched turned to gold. Humans are stuck in a familiar Midas-like predicament. We can't directly experience the true texture of reality because everything we touch turns to matter. Last quote, second last quote, and, and the second last slide. If the world is one substance, as satisfying as this discovery may be to philosophers, it is profoundly disturbing to physicists, as long as they do not understand the nature of that substance. For if quantum, if quantum stuff is all there is, and you don't understand quantum stuff, your ignorance is complete. <laughs> slide. We have reached an interesting position ever since the beginning of modern science four or five hundred years ago. Scientific thought seems to have moved man and consciousness further from the centre of things. More and more of the universe has become explicable in mechanical objective terms and even human beings are becoming understood scientifically by biologists and behavioural scientists. Now we find that physics, previously considered to be the most objective of all sciences is reinventing the need for the human soul and putting it right at the center of our understanding of the universe. Alternatively, others have suggested that the world is observed not by ourselves, but by another eternal conscious being, whom we might as well call God. The idea that God has a role in ensuring the continual existence of objects that are not being observed by human beings is actually quite an old one and led to the following 19th century liberation. To a, it also led to a passage of Hebrews 1, which I'll read in a second. There once was a man who said, God must think it exceedingly odd if he finds that this tree continues to be when there's no one about in the quad. <laughs> Dear sir, your astonishment's odd. I am always about in the quad, and that's why the tree will continue to be since observed by your spaceship. Which is nothing more than really what is being said in Hebrews 1. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, <coughs> and through whom also he made the universe. A very complex universe, I might add. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things. 